Hello, and welcome to this discussion of race relations in the church, sponsored by Energion Publications. With us, we have two of our authors, Dr. Terrell Carter, who is uh, currently the executive director of RISE Community Development. He has experience as an officer in the St. Louis Police Department for five years. He has been a pastor. He has been a professor and a vice president at a Christian university and brings a great deal of knowledge and experience uh, to this discussion. With us as well is uh, Dr. Alan Bevere, who is uh, a pastor. He has been a volunteer police chaplain in a small town police department. He continues as a pastor in the East Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church and has also been an adjunct professor at Ashland Theological Seminary. So to both of you today, uh, welcome. Thank you for having Thanks. me. Good to be here. Okay, with everything that's going on right now, let's just <coughs> dive in the deep end. Uh, we've just gotten the verdict in the uh, Derek Chauvin uh, trial. Uh, Terrell, with both your pastor and police officer, I would imagine you have a few thoughts about that. Uh, so could you give us some comment on the on uh, what happens now, what uh, the nature of the verdict? For our, our listeners, our viewers, um, I was a police officer in, for the city of St. Louis from 1997 to 2002. I was in my early 20s at the time. And the first two years uh, that I was a police officer was the first time St. Louis was designated as the most dangerous city in the United States. And the area, the district, the car, the neighborhood, the community that I patrolled was the most dangerous portion of St. Louis. Um, I went, you know, one summer where I saw every four days somebody uh, lose their life in, in multiple different ways. Um, I understand that policing is a complex um, job. Relationships with communities are very complex. Um, but I also understand being a black male myself who did not have positive experiences with police officers when I was growing up. And I left the police department because my partner planted drugs on a group of people and lied to, and tried to send them to prison in an unjust manner. Uh, and I ended up testifying against him and he did five years in the federal penitentiary. So I see this question or this idea of policing from multiple perspectives. And as it relates to Derek Chauvin, um, I truthfully did not expect him, expect him to be convicted on all counts, just to be truthful. Uh, within the last month in the city of St. Louis, uh, we had a very a similar trial in the sense that we had uh, five police officers who were found to have abused an undercover police officer during a protesting event and a portion of their abuse to him was recorded on video. They sent text messages the day before, you know, extensive messages saying that they couldn't wait to beat somebody up that night. Uh, there was a attempt, uh, an, a attempt to cover up some of the things that happened with his beating. Um, and the jury was able, or the defend, uh, defense was able to make the jury an all white jury with one minority al alternate. And uh, to no one's surprise, the police officers that were on trial were all found not guilty uh, of anything. Um, so it was hard for me to have confidence that Derek Chauvin was going to be convicted, uh, even though we had extensive, you know, the entire incident was videotaped. Uh, but what I understand is a, a defense, uh, their job is not to, to talk about what happened or to help people understand what happened, but instead to cloud uh, the the whole conversation. And so uh, I think that the only reason that this was not clouded was because the entire incident was uh, recorded fully. And you also had an extensive list of other police officers that came out and testified against Derek Chauvin. Uh, I don't celebrate any of this because, it, you know, number one, a person lost their life. Uh, number two, um, this is going to serve as uh, a, a turning point uh, in some sense is a good thing, but in some, uh, some sense is a not so good thing, uh, a relationship between uh, communities and police. 
Uh, and I'm also not happy because we're not focused on, it's been turned into a political football like everything is. Uh, but more importantly, we're not looking at, you know, the intricacies and all the different things that go on in policing. We have now boiled it down to it's either this or that and not have recognized all the other things that go into it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for justice for the family. Um, I am not grateful that anyone's life has been lost. And let's think about it again. A police officer is now about to spend a long time in prison. His family is going to be affected. Um, just like, or not as extensively as Derek Chauvin's family has been affected, but uh, nobody wins in this, I guess is the best way to, to say it. Alan? I uh, listened, I watched the verdict, and I too was surprised he was convicted on all three uh, counts. Um, and everybody that I had listened to or watched uh, expressed uh, what Terrell expressed, that they didn't think uh, there was any way he was going to be convicted on all three counts. So that's quite, uh, that is quite an event. I, I think um, the, the thing that uh, <clears throat> reminds me of how much work there is to be done is that um, this, uh, th this whole uh, incident would never have gone to trial if uh, if the attorney general of Minnesota hadn't stepped in, uh, and that it was just another example of how uh, how a police officer who certainly his behavior was way over the line. I mean, I I said to somebody last week, I said, I don't know on what planet should anyone be allowed to kneel on somebody's neck for over nine minutes, and. Uh, and that had not also, I think, uh, the video of taken by the young woman, uh, was she 14 or 17, something like that, that if she had not taken that video on her phone, uh, would that incident ever even made much in the way of headlines other than protests from people um, with, with, uh, with no way to... Uh, uh, confirm those events that happened. So, so I, I think this, I think that, that, uh, the verdict was, uh, the right verdict. I think there were things had that happened in this trial. We haven't seen, uh, before, uh, like police officers testifying, uh, against uh, another police officer. But, um, the disturbing thing for me was, um, there was a poll taken, uh, and um, 40 some percent in this poll uh, said that they thought the verdict was uh, was wrong, that he was not guilty. And uh, that, uh, you know, so when you look at that, you say, oh, my goodness, I've got this video here. If if this if this isn't the kind of behavior that that can be prosecuted, what is? And and uh, so. So we still, uh, there's a lot of disturbing things that are still happening. And, um, but I do, I do think, I do think that uh, what, what happened uh, with the trial is going in the right direction. So. Alan, do you mind if I ask you a question? Why do you think, sure. why do you think that poll came with that data? Why do you think that 40% of people thought it was the wrong uh, burden? Um, well, it had to do with political affiliation. The, the, the reality is, is that um, those whose politics are more conservative tended to think that the, uh, the verdict was wrong. So I don't know what to make of that other than to say that um, I think there's a bias uh, in favor of, of uh, the behavior of police officers and probably a bias against the fact that Derek uh, was African American, but as far as drilling down, I don't know. But but that's what I saw in the poll. Uh, I just remember, is uh, George Floyd is the one who was. Uh, was I'm sorry, George. Uh, George Floyd. I, uh, Derek. Is, Derek, Derek yeah. is Derek Chauvin was the uh, was the police yeah. officer. Apologize for that. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, I just well, I just want to make clear because I want to ask you both a question. Uh, as something that's bothered me, and I would, you know, like to hear both of you comment on. I'll start this time with you, with you, Alan. Is the number of people who have commented on uh, George Floyd's criminal record and background? 
is that actually relevant in a case like this? I, I guess what I would say to that, uh, and not really knowing a whole lot about his background, um, but it seems to me that uh, that it's not relevant um, how his criminal background contributed to Derek Chauvin kneeling on his neck for nine min nine nine plus minutes is hard to imagine. I mean, what 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 do you have to have in your past that that becomes acceptable behavior? Okay, and, and, I, go ahead. I was about to say I agree, I, but it's a it's a deflection mechanism. Uh, so I've written two books on policing, one on my experiences and why I left the department, and then one as an academic and pastoral book to white communities so they understand the history of policing and how it actually affects African Americans because historically the data, everything about reality shows that white people's experiences with police is completely different from minority people's, uh, minorities' experiences. And what white people base their opinion on is not lived experience, but what they see on television and how conservative news, I can't even call them news, conservative opinion outlets like Fox show them. And I'm not saying that Fox is any better or any worse than CNN or MSNBC or any, but they don't base it on personal experience. They base it on the data or the information or the vantage point that somebody gives to them. Because when you ask, well, what is your experience like with African-Americans or how many, you know, how many African-American and I'm just using African-American because I'm African-American and you are white. Um, what is what is it like with your African-American friends? Well, I don't have any African-American friends. Well, then what do you, how do you understand what they're going through? How do you, well, I don't, I, I get it from, I, I read this. I, that's not legitimate. That is all packaged to be able to push a very particular agenda. Uh, the question you asked, Henry, was, is it relevant for his criminal background? No. Because you're supposed to, as a trained officer, you're supposed to take every incident as a singular incident. Now, if it's a violent crime, that's something slightly different. But if it's somebody who's passing checks, that's not a, a capital offense. That's not even, you know, there are city charges, state charges, and then felony charges. And then there are classes or, you know, levels to that. Based on what the charge is, that is the level of force or the level of, uh, you know, whatever that you come to the situation with. And then there were four officers there. So there was no need to do any of the things that they did. The question I would ask is, and I, I, I didn't pay attention. I mean, I didn't want, I paid attention to it. I did not watch the actual trial because again, I did not have faith in the system that things were going to turn out the way they did. My question would be, what is the relevance of their common background, their common experience together? Because if I'm remembering correctly, both of them worked uh, security at a club in the community. And what kind of ought did Derek Chauvin have against him based on whatever experience they may have had, you know, in his civilian and his, they call it secondary when a police officer works security somewhere. Uh, you know, what happened there? I, I asked the same question when Michael Brown was shot and killed in Ferguson. Um, everyone, you, well, my more conservative friends would comment, uh, you know, well, he, all these things about Michael Brown. And my question was, well, maybe Michael Brown decided he needed to fight back because that officer had done something to him before in the past. And that's what most people don't understand. When I was a police officer, we had officers who terrorized communities and people just got tired of it. And they wondered, what can I do to protect myself and my family? Because you are not going to protect me. Your coworkers are not going to protect me. Actually, they're going to either sign on and join in, or they're just going to turn a blind eye and let you do what you want to do. At some point, I have to defend myself, defend my family, defend my property. Uh, those are the kind of questions that I would be, would, have, would be asking. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's uh, a good point. There's, you know, one of the things as, as you are talking, Terrell, that I uh, have been saying is, is that the white community <clears throat> needs to do more listening and less talking in reference to uh, uh, policing and the racial it matters uh, is that we need to, you know, we need to quit white splaining to African Americans <laughs> what their what their uh, experience should be, right? Or how so you've you've had, you've had one experience, Terrell, but now I come in to to 
to help you and correct you on interpreting what it was you experienced and it's not what you think. We and, and so there's not enough listening. You know, 20 years ago, I would say that I had a lot of the same perspectives that a lot of more conservative white folks have on systemic racism, not really thinking that there was there, embedded racism. And then one of the things I started to do, maybe about 12, 13 years ago, was I, I one of the classes that I have taught is Christian ethics. And of course, at some point you deal with race. And when we would get to that, I would actually, I would actually not uh, have material to present on that or much material. But I would, say, I would say to my students, who many of them were often at a good percentage of them African Americans, I would say, talk to us about race. What's your experience? Um, and it was over that process that I began to realize that. Uh, you know, I had drawn all kinds of conclusions uh, that were that were false uh, because I I was reading my experience of being white in America onto onto uh, African Americans, and so over time, my mind began to change on this because of these voices. I credit my students with this, uh, who were willing to speak candidly and tell the truth, and so we we can't begin. Uh, to make headway as long as uh, too many of us who are white don't want to hear this. We're not comfortable with it. We, we're afraid that uh, maybe our reality will be changed. Our world will be changed and we don't want that. Uh, and so it's much easier for us to talk uh, than to listen. So we need to do a lot more listening. Like I need to do a lot more listening to Terrell. I mean, I, I think I have something to contribute here, but but I think at the end of the day, what Terrell has to say matters matters more. The reason I brought this particular conversation together is because I think in the church, uh, we have, there's some things that we can do in the church. And this goes back to the issue of listening uh, and the fact that remarkably few white people have taken a pew in black churches and actually spent any time. Uh, and uh, my understanding from listening to African American pastors is that at least here in this part of the country, uh, white people who go to black churches come under quite a bit of pressure because nobody, if a black family goes to a white church, nobody asks why. If a white family goes to a black church, uh, that comes under pressure, and so that's eliminate that that eliminates an opportunity to listen. So I'm going to pass it back to Terrell here. If you can, uh, let's start talking about what can we do in the church to improve race relations, because I don't think the church is that much different from the rest of the community right now. No, you're right. And unfortunately, the church influences much of the things that are occurring right now. Um, again. None of my comments tell you whether I am a Republican or Democrat, Democrat or Republican. They don't tell you whether I'm conservative or liberal, liberal or conservative. Uh, but the white evangelical church is on the forefront of the dis dysfunction that uh, we see. And I don't say that as a slight against them. It's just what they have always done as part of the course. So I, I wrote a book called uh, um, uh, Healing Racial Divides, Finding Strength in Our Diversity and in, in every book that I, I write, I, I try to give these practical suggestions. And one of the first ones is go to a place or put yourself in a position where you are not the expert. So as you were saying, Henry, go to a place of discomfort, meaning where you are the minority and just listen. Uh, but also not only listen, but ask how you can help. It's going to be uncomfortable, to say the least. It's never comfortable to hear someone tell you, here goes what you or your particular group has done wrong and how you have missed a mark. And so be prepared to be uncomfortable. And that's not a personal thing. It's not that people are attacking you. So as a former police officer, when people find that out about me, then they want to tell me everything that police has ever done wrong. And I have to say, you're right. And I'm no longer a police officer, but I understand 
and for those who I still have relationships with and police officers that I you know, may have any kind of influence with, I'll share these kinds of stories with them so they can know what citizens are saying. But I have to also recognize again, number one, they're not attacking me. They are attacking the system or expressing frustration and pain from something that has happened. But again, the other important thing is put yourself in a position where you are not the expert, where you're not the person in power. And sometimes that means don't ask a black person to go meet at Starbucks. And I, that sounds like a joke when I say that, but I would tell people, you know, when white pastors or when, you know, people say, hey, you do this, uh, you do it well, I want to have a conversation with you so you can help me. Uh, can you meet me in the community where I live at the Starbucks? I don't drink coffee. And I, to be truthful, I don't feel comfortable at Starbucks because of some of the things that have happened in the past. So why is your first expectation for me to come to you where you are comfortable? Why not come to me where I'm comfortable or at a minimum meet somewhere halfway where neither one of us is in a power position and we both are coming to the, you know, the meeting uh, on a kind of similar grounds. Uh, Alan? So one of the things that we're doing in our congregation, uh, our, where, our, where, uh, where we are in Ashland, Ashland is a small town. It's a university town, but it's a smaller town. It's mostly white, um, not 100 percent, but it is mostly a white community. Um, we have a, a church a block down from us that is an African-American church. And uh, the pastor and I have known each other uh, for a while, for a long time, actually, before I came to Ashland to pastor. And we've gotten to know each other and we've had lunch a few times and we've had conversation about beginning to partner together to do things together as two congregations uh, and not only not only uh, to build relationships between our two churches, but to build relationships in the community around us because we're we're a block from each other. So we serve the same community. And we actually were going to begin doing that last year, last summer, but then COVID hit and uh, uh, things were put on the back burner. But we are hoping this summer to begin that. And I just think one of the things that congregations should do, white congregations should do, if they is that is that begin to do some things with African American congregations, do some whether it's worship together or or um, some other kind of events where we can get to know each other, where we can build that relationship. And once you get into that uh, uh, level of trust, then we can hear the stories. We can hear about the experiences. And uh, and yes, it will make us uncomfortable at times, but that's okay. So I think one of the things to do is just to work to build relationships with Christians who are not white. Yeah, the uh, segregation of Sunday morning at, uh, at time for church, 10 or 11, whatever it is, seems to be one of the big factors in, uh, in making this difficult. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess that is that is something that uh, you're both indicating is not that easy to change. So could you think a bit, bit about now, and I've heard stories about this, but I'm not going to intrude my own stories into it, but about pastors' organizations, how much communication there is, there anything that could be done uh, with pastors' groups uh, talking more to one another? Uh, Go ahead, Terrell. I think that there could, there could be benefits and there could be detriments to that. I mean, I am, um, so my calling, I am obviously African-American, grew up in the Black Baptist tradition, but have never been called to serve a Black Baptist church. I've always been called to serve literally, you know, white congregations. And um, when I, but I've maintained my relationships with the Black Baptist church and I'm actually a part of um, uh, African-American pastors um, group that meets on a weekly basis. Uh, and just to be truthful, they struggle with how to be in relationship with, you know, white denominations or white groups or white pastors uh, because of fear and because of uh, expectations, uh, because of all those things. I think that there is a benefit and there is an opportunity But this idea of discomfort is not just on one side either. It's on every side. 
Um, I think that it can be beneficial. I think that it can be uh, productive. Uh, for example, uh, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship is an independent uh, Baptist denomination. And several years ago, they had a national event and I was tabbed to help run the event in St. Louis. And what I did was intentionally connected one of the most important African-American Baptist pastors in the city with one of the most important white Baptist pastors in the county. And our event was the largest event that happened in the United States. And it took place at a black Baptist church. We had you know, white Christians there. We had uh, Burmese Christians there as well. But there was this tension because there was this goofiness, this unknownness of what it would look like while we were there. Uh, white uh, choir sang what would have been considered in their world, old Negro spirituals, and we're not anything like <laughs> traditional Black Negro spirituals. Uh, but, you know, again, it was a certain level of discomfort, but some friendships were formed and based off that. And I'm not trying to bounce around and not answer your question. I think there are opportunities that you have to be very strategic in how those kinds of relationships are built, you know, uh, uh, an event, uh, you know, once every, you do it once a year, and then once twice a year, and then once a quarter or whatever it is, something strategic where everyone gets a chance to be involved, the leadership for the event is shared, and no one necessarily gets the, the glory, but everyone gets an opportunity to share and, and help in the lead. I would say then that the bottom line uh, for there is it's it's not it's not necessarily simple. There's a there's work to be done. I would have to observe if I'm talking to uh, other people who are white. Is I have found it extremely useful to simply ask and then sit down and and listen. And I have really never been made that uncomfortable by those African Americans I've asked. <laughs> you know, you know, hey, talk to me, and people, there's really, I've found very little, you know, condemnation, uh, some hard things to hear, but usually uh, just, you know, very helpful, and so I would like to recommend that procedure to my white, other people who are white is ask, <laughs> go ahead and ask the question, I've really never been beaten up for asking the question, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, so that that helps. I can understand having run a number of events. I can understand how an event could be really interesting, and my also white wife frequently comments about white choirs doing uh, spirituals. She says that choir is too white. That's one of her comments she'll make. Because <laughs> she and I both like to listen to African American choirs doing them, and so you actually you musically you do notice. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's that's the sideline joke. Uh, go ahead, Alan. Do you have any anything on this? Well, yeah. I mean, I I I think in in building those relationships, there's there's just a lot of cultural assumptions or stereotypical assumptions that need to be uh, encountered and questioned. You know, the, my experience with ministerial associations. Um, you know, the the ministerial association in our town is very active. They do a lot of wonderful things and ministry to the community. But, uh, and, and again, it's basically mostly white. And, and I think I, we, we've never engaged this conversation. And, and I'm guessing maybe it's because we either don't want to or it's just not where we live. And so, you know, why stir up the controversy? So that's my ex experience. Uh, with our current uh, with our current incarnation of of, min of ministerial association that I'm with, but uh, you know, pastors, I know I know pat white pastors who are just who feel who feel that there is a problem and feel feel that we need to work toward uh, racial uh, justice and reconciliation, but they're afraid to speak up because of their congregations and. Uh, I think I think we are now in a time when we at least need to be stand we need at least need to stand up and be counted as to where we are and and what we believe and certainly allow for the conversation uh, to happen and develop but I think it's just easier for a lot of white pastors to just 
you know, particularly if they're not in a in a rate a community that's racially diverse. I think it's it's easy just for them to ignore it or or go their own way. Um, it's interesting how many people that I get, how many white pastors I know in our conference who, when they, I see them at annual conference or at some kind of meeting, they will say to me how much they appreciate what I write and post in reference to these kinds of issues. They feel they, they want they want to speak up, but they're afraid to do so. Um, and I, I, I know it, depending on the situation and the person, it may not be easy. But I think it's something we need to at least start saying, you know, this is important. We had a we had we've had a, a Black Lives Matter uh, protest in downtown for months, uh, even when COVID hit. Uh, a small group were down there faithfully every day, and uh, there were those who were very supportive, and obviously there were those uh, who were not, and, uh, and they took some abuse. Uh, from from people driving by, but uh, I think it's just important for pastors to be willing to speak up and say, you know, folks, uh, all is not right here. All is not okay. Okay, le- we've uh, taken up pretty much uh, our time. What I would like to do is, uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll start with you, Alan, and then pass it back to Terrell and ask you just for any uh, any final thoughts you may have just given them. <laughs> the importance of speaking up. That's an excellent message. Uh, but uh, give you a chance there, and then I'll pass it to Terrell to, to conclude. Well, I would just again say the two things. I, I talked about speaking up, but the importance again of those of us who are white to listen, to be willing to listen to our African American and other minorities, what they experience. Right now, we're seeing some things going on uh, with the Asian American community because of. Um, you know, people's perspectives on COVID in China. Uh, we we need to just do a lot more listening. We just need to hear the stories uh, from people who don't, we may live in the same spot, but we don't live in the same world. And we need to listen to those those stories and and be willing to consider them. So yes, we do need to speak up, say things are not the way they should be, but we need to do a lot of listening. I, I would add, when we do the listening, don't do the listening in an echo chamber. Uh, yes. Because we have enough data and information yes, that shows that we have. gravitate yes. towards people who believe the same thing we believe and feel like we feel. Uh, again, go to a place of discomfort and listen to someone who is completely different from you. But I would even add, do your own research. Uh, most people don't understand that, you know, most of the laws that were created in the United States were created to control someone of color, whether it was Native Americans, African Americans, or Asian Americans, or Native Americans, Black people, uh, Asian people. Essentially, most of the laws, if not, you know, 80% of the laws that were created, were created in response to someone, some group gaining freedom and our founders or the original people who you know populated tried to populate expand this nation their response to that and how they wanted to keep themselves in power and keep someone else their importance minimized that's baked into the dna of our country how do we get rid of that or how do we manage that how do we make that different doesn't mean that all people are bad doesn't mean that all white people are bad that's not what i'm saying at all doesn't mean that all government is bad doesn't mean that all police are bad but the question has to be asked, what does that mean for all of that to be in the DNA of our country, of our criminal justice system, of our police departments? And then how do we manage that? And how do we manage the relationships that come from that as well? Okay, well, I wanna thank you both. Uh, appreciate your time. And hopefully this can be a start for all of us at some uh, listening and paying attention.